So could you introduce yourself quickly for Clean Technica? Sure. Christina Lamasti, I'm from Maja Metal. And uh, what, is, what are you working on? So Maja Metal is making a new class of materials that are called nanolaminated alloys, which basically means we make layered materials. They're kind of like plywood, if you're familiar with plywood. Uh, but the plies are on the nanometer scale. So these are metal-based materials that have interfaces in them. And we're basically architecting a new, a new performance uh, set of characteristics in metals by virtue of creating these laminated alloys. Um, it's a completely different way of contemplating uh, the design of a material. So if you look at the history of metals, in fact, this has been a quest of the industry for thousands of years. The Tower of Giza, which is not too far away from us here, um, was, was actually the first site where laminated materials were discovered. The steel of 100 refinings in China, the Tamakogani steels in Japan, all have been trying to balance the performance of metals, the characteristics that typically you have to trade off by creating these laminated structures. And the challenge has always been how to produce them cost effectively, because it takes a lot of energy, in that case, human energy, hammering, folding, hammering, folding, uh, to produce these kinds of structures. And so they've eluded us at an industrial scale. They really, we really haven't been able to capture the performance characteristics and the potential of these materials until now. So and, and what connection does this have to sustainability and uh, the climate? Sure, that's a wonderful question. So sustainability is not just about, um, it's not just about new forms of energy. It's about using energy in more efficient ways. So the manufacturing process that we leverage to produce these materials now at large scale is electrochemical. It's a very efficient process. We input electrons and, and leverage those electrons to transition a metal from an ionic species into an actual piece of metal. There's no heat involved. So the energy efficiency of that process is very high because we don't lose energy in the form of heat. It's one electron in, one, one metal atom out. Um, and so that means that we consume less energy in the production process. But there's also another dimension of sustainability to our, um, to our applications, and that is that because of the high performance of the materials, so the nanolamination allows us to produce metals using the same basic raw materials that are significantly stronger. They're more corrosion resistant. They're stiffer. They are harder. They don't wear as quickly. And so what that means is a more efficient use of our precious raw materials you're using less metal because it's a stronger material. You don't have to replace it as frequently because it lasts longer. So there are profound impacts both on the energy consumption side as well as on the raw material consumption side. So the so what are the, uh, the imp some of the implications of this? Sure, it, I think it's interesting when you think about the implications of any material technology in society. It's actually noteworthy that we define not only changes in economies, but also changes in civilization by their their materials of manufacture. So there's a reason that we call it the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and the Steel Age and the Aluminum Age, arguably, and, and ultimately, you know, maybe the nanolaminated alloy age or the monumental age. It because we we are so dependent on our materials of construction for infrastructure, for our ability to do what we're doing today, to build the infrastructure that's going to be the next generation of of renewable energy technology. And so if we can change that, that energy consumption profile, if we can change the efficiency of that industry, if we can change the performance profile and the concept around how these materials are designed, we could very well usher in an entirely new economic wave that, that could change the way we approach design of materials that could, that could allow our engineers to design much more flexible solutions to the kinds of problems we're facing. I, I want to mention that, you know, obviously the, the challenges we're trying to solve in efficiency of materials, as well as the challenges that we've heard about this week in energy and sustainability, they're technical challenges at their core, right? These are, these are technical problems. And so it's gonna take participation in science, technology, engineering, and math to really solve these problems. And one of the challenges that I'm keenly aware of is participation 
in that in that field of study. So getting women in particular engaged in this field of study to bring different perspectives to potential solutions uh, is a big challenge, and it's it's a challenge. I think you know obviously we recognize in the United States and is is very well recognized here in the UAE and some of the initiatives to try to engage women in the workforce in particular around these kind of STEM challenges. Yeah, we were just speaking about that about how how huge the representation of women is in, in STEM here in, in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi, in Mazdar. Um, can you speak a little bit about what you, th why you think that is? How, how have they s stimulated so much female involvement in STEM, whereas so many countries around the world, like the US, mm -hmm. talk about it, aim for it, but don't quite don't it. quite get there. It's, yeah. it's it. I mean, look, Title IX legislation's been around in the United States since the seventies, and what's noteworthy is that from an from an academic participation standpoint in STEM, the UAE has already outpaced the United States. There is there is much greater academic participation of women in STEM here in the UAE. So it's actually more I, than men. I yes, yeah. <laughs> more than men. <laughs> And, um, and so I think there's a lot that we can learn from that model. I think the UA has taken a very strategic approach to addressing this challenge. They've been very thoughtful about what the objective is and how they're going to encourage women to participate in these fields. I think both of our countries um, are still facing the challenge of translating that participation in the academic environment to jobs. So both countries still have 25% or less of the workforce of the STEM workforce is actually women. And so there's there's an opportunity for us to collaborate around this, this challenge and try to come up with creative solutions and look at it maybe from different perspectives and, and try to figure out how to encourage women to really to really lend their, their capability and their perspective to addressing some of these challenges in the workforce in particular. Thank you very much for your time. We you. appreciate it. We'll surely follow up with you later on, I'm sure. Thank you.